So welcome, bee lovers from around the world, and thank you for joining us here in TAV, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation, and MATC, Mashav's Agricultural Training Center, in this celebration of World Bee Day. Please note that this lecture will be recorded and the video will be available on our YouTube channel, the Mashav MATC YouTube channel, so that you can watch it again and share it with your friends and colleagues. To ask questions during the lecture, please, please use the chat button located on the toolbar on the, at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer all of the questions at the end of the lecture. Before I introduce uh, today's lecturer, I would like to show you a short film about Mashav. Let's see, I hope it will work. Okay. Uh, Here we go. Mashav, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation, was launched 60 years ago to share the know-how and technologies which provided the basis for Israel's own rapid development. Mashav aims to empower those living in poverty in a holistic and innovative way and support fellow nations and communities in their struggle to achieve sustainable development, placing people at the heart of its initiatives. Our agricultural programs use unique techniques and farming methods to increase sustainability, food security, and hunger eradication. We believe that investment in education is an investment in our future and an agent for change around the world. We coordinate Israel's official humanitarian assistance, building medical facilities and supplying medicine in the wake of earthquakes, floods, famine, and other disasters. Mashav promotes innovative entrepreneurship as a means of advancing growth and prosperity. We believe that gender equality and women's empowerment are central to reach sustainable development. Our philosophy is to leave no one behind. During six decades, Mashav has trained over 300,000 people from more than 140 countries and has established development projects worldwide. Mashav, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation, is celebrating 60 years of sharing its experience and partnering for a better world. Okay, so now, so now it is uh, my honor and my pleasure to introduce today's lecturer, Professor Guy Bloch from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Professor Bloch is a professor, a member of the Center for the Study of Rationality. Um, he is also a member of the Jerusalem Brain Community, and he specializes in insect sociobiology, chronobiology, and physiology. And today he will share with us on the social clock of the bee. So Guy, the floor is yours, please. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can, but you have to go into full, uh, full presentation mode. Yes, yes, perfect, perfect. Okay, now, now you can see my uh, main screen. It's okay, Tami? Yes, it's fine. Perfect. Okay. So it, it is a real pleasure to be here and I'm really excited to see all the faces from people all over the world. And I hope that everyone is doing well in this very difficult and unique period that we are experiencing globally. And, uh, and this is uh, also an exciting uh, day in the sense that it's the bee day and bees are extremely important both for uh, agriculture, but also for many uh, ecological services and uh, ecology. And uh, so I'm not surprised that it's uh, getting attention, but uh, my, in, my uh, interest with bees is actually mostly as a kind of model system to understand social behavior and the complex behavior in general. 
And uh, the research that we are doing is, is uh, combining both questions that relate to the evolution of sociality and the evolution of behavior and uh, the function of behavior and specifically social behavior, but not uh, only, we do a lot of work also on uh, circadian rhythms and chronobiology, which is the discipline that uh, explore a uh, timing, biological timing. Uh, and today I will speak about the social clock of the bee. So all of you, all, uh, everyone here that have seen uh, a beehive or a, a ant colony know that social insect colonies are extremely complex. They, they contain thousands and in, in some cases even millions of individuals that need to coordinate almost any aspect of their life. And one of the challenges in, in this uh, complex coordination is related to the temporal organization, the organization of time. And I will, I will speak about several aspects, mostly focusing on the, on the social behavior, but not only. So let, let me just uh, remind you that if we, we look on, uh, on our globe, on, the, on our planet, it's uh, rotating around its axis. And this, this rotation around its axis have uh, one very important meaning that uh, each one of your countries that I, I hope that you can see while the video is running is exposed to a night and day at the certain times of the, of the day. And it has a lot of uh, biological meanings and the animals and other creatures have evolved to live with these predicted changes in their environment. And uh, we can speak, for, uh, for example, from a, an ecological perspective on an uh, eco ecological niche. So we can see here, for example, uh, two different birds of prey about the same size, a falcon that is active during the day, it's a journal, and a burn owl, an owl that is active during the night, we call it nocturnal. And we see many, many variation around uh, this uh, theme. But it's very profound that uh, animals and other creatures time their activity to certain phase of the, of the day. And it's also, you know, uh, humans are, are not different. Many of the processes in our body are actually regulated by internal clocks. And in this case, we speak about uh, the circadian clock, which is the best studied clocks, one of the, the more important ones. Uh, and it's regulate processes and it's uh, time processes of around the day, of around 24 hours. So circa in uh, Latin, it's about, and the end is, is a day, so it's about a day. Um, and uh, I will just mention that there are other biological clocks. For example, there are, the, there are clocks that time uh, cycles of about a year, but we, we will focus here on, on, a, on around 24 hours. So if we look on uh, some of the most uh, obvious or uh, better known uh, processes that are influenced by the circadian clock in, uh, in our body, they are timed here. And you can see, for example, that some of you, I hope, are in the time of highest alertness now. Those that are before noon, others, for example, are in the fastest uh, reaction times, so or maybe they will uh, better understand if uh, something uh, is wrong in the presentation. And you can see that many physiological and behavioral processes, by the way, including learning and memory, for example, is regulated by the clock. And uh, there is a, a extremely significant research in, in recent years on biological clocks, because it's not only they, that they influence all these processes that we see here, but actually many of the diseases and illnesses and uh, malfunctions of our body are associated with some uh, issues, I would uh, tell it with the biological clocks. It can be mutations in clock genes, it can be some other factors, but it's extremely important for, uh, from, from a medical perspective or well being perspective. And the uh, honeybees, our favorite today, that we are celebrating today, uh, were one of the first models in research on, on the, uh, specifically the behavior of circadian rhythms. And here you can see a summary of a study that was done about one, 100 years ago by Belling in the Germany. And she, she used a, a very uh, 
simple technique in which you can train bees to arrive to a feeder with sugar syrup at a certain time during the day. So when she started to work, it was already known that the bees are active during the day that, and they, they, they know to come and visit flowers at certain hours. And she tried to see if she can, can learn them or can teach them, excuse me. And uh, here you can see these boxes. I hope that you can see my, uh, my arrow, my cursor. The boxes in uh, between 7.30 and 9, 1 and 3, and 6 and 7.30 mark the time in which during the training session she provided sugar syrup. So for about one week, the bees learned to visit these feeders during the time. And then they came to the test day. And during the test day, there is no reward. She just provided empty, empty uh, dishes and they recorded to which one of them and, and at what time the bees arrived. And these are the, the boxes. Each box is a bee that is coming and trying to land on the empty feeder. And you can see that the bees are anticipating the time that they used to uh, receive the reward. So the bees can learn. This was one of the first experiments showing that animals can learn the time of day. They call it time learning or time memory or time uh, sensing. Today, we know that bees can do uh, a lot of other uh, processes that relate to the clock. And this is uh, very important for their interactions with plants because plants also have uh, circadian rhythms that can affect uh, the flowers. And for those of you that are uh, interested uh, to read a, a review that we wrote about it, I put it here. It's with another, with the Rachel Green, which is a, a plant chronobiologist uh, from the same university that I am. And this is a brief summary of what we, we discuss in this paper and uh, showing the, the plants uh, and, the, and the bees circadian rhythm. So we call it time is honey because it's extremely important. So flower opening, nectar production, scent release, petal movement, pollen availability, all those processes can be, you know, it's not always the case, but they can be under uh, the, the control of the circadian clock. And from the, the side of the bee, we see, for example, uh, sun compass orientation, anticipation, time memory, uh, just their, their pattern of activity. And in the case of honeybees, also their famous dense language communication, all those are regulated by the circadian clock. As for sun compass orientation and dense communication, I would just mention that the role of the clock is that these processes refer to the location of the sun. And given that the sun moves, animals need to use their circadian clock to compensate for the time movement. So it's extremely important. Another demonstration of the importance of the clock for the normal foraging behavior of bees is shown by this uh, study that uh, we look on, on a Verbascume uh, flowers, the, the yellow flowers that we see here, and we just recorded, this is a, a field study, the number of visits of uh, various bees, and you can see that bumblebees, the black bars, came very early in, in the morning, 6, 7 in the morning, 6, 7 a.m. in the morning. The other bees, the wild bees in this location, which is uh, the hills around Jerusalem, they came much later, and since this flower provides only pollen, we think that the bumblebees are actually depleting the, the pollen from the flowers. So they have a, a very significant ecological influence. And uh, although it's not the topic of, of my talk, I, I still want to mention it because it's probably something that is uh, of great concern for many of you and to, to many of us around the world, is the fact that there are uh, more and more uh, stressors that are affecting the bees and the population throughout the, the world are declining. So there were a lot of uh, media attention for uh, the risk of a world without bees. And one of the culprits for this uh, disappearance is a, a relatively new group of, of insecticides that those of you that involved in agriculture are probably using them. It's called neonicotinoids. And the reason that uh, they call this name is that they affect the, cholinerg the cholinergic uh, system. And uh, the general function of uh, the way that they act is what we are seeing here. This is like a synapse in the body of, 
uh, insects or even uh, mammals. In red, we see the neonicotinoids, the pesticide, and they are inter interacting with the nicotinic receptors, which are receptors for acetylcholine. So they interfere with cholinergic choline communication, which is extremely important in insects for coordinating many, many of their behaviors and learning their memory. So exposure to neonics, to neonicotinoids is, is devastating for insects. And uh, it was actually the effect was uh, discovered when people start to look on bees. And uh, our small contribution, because we are interested in circadian rhythms, was to, to, to start and test if it's affecting their circadian rhythms, because as I mentioned, it's very important for uh, foraging bees. So we, we collected the newly emerged bees, as the young one that you see here from the hive. We exposed them to light, dark illumination regime. This is in training or synchronizing their circadian clock with the light, dark in, uh, uh, cycle. And then we transfer them to constant darkness, a very constant environment, constant da uh, darkness, constant temperature. And we use the um, uh, data acquisition system to monitor their activity. So each bee is housed individually in a cage. I will, I will show you additional studies with this system. And their activity is monitored with the system. And it's recorded in, on what we call a ectogram, it's activity graphs. So each row in this uh, presentation is a day. And um, the x-axis is the time of day. And each day is presented twice. That's why you see two uh, darker parts. And the dark small columns are the level of activity. It's a proxy, it's a measure of the level of activity. And if there is a strong rhythm, you see something like you see here, that they are more active during some part of the day. And we can learn a lot of things about the circadian rhythms using this technique. And uh, we did it with bees that we exposed to various doses of uh, imidacloprid, which is the most commonly used uh, neonicotinoid, uh, neonicotinoid in Israel, but also in other parts of the world. So we exposed them to 110 or 100 microgram liter uh, imidacloprid, which is a field, all those are field real, realistic uh, doses. 100, it's a little bit high, but it's still used in some places. And of course, we have a control, which is a clean uh, sugar syrup. And we tested the uh, various uh, properties of the circadian clock. So here you see a closer look of this double plot uh, actogram. So you can see the days. It's on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you see the time of day. And you can see that each day is actually plotted twice. So you can look at the first day here, and you can see that the same pattern is appearing again here. This is done just to facilitate visual detection of rhythms. And then you can see that every day, because this record was done in, in a constant environment, so the locomotor activity of the bee is driven only by its internal clock. There are no external influences because the, the environment is constant. And you can see that the bee started every day its activity a little bit earlier, which means that the internal rhythm of the bee, which we call it free running period or tau, it's in, in this case, it's about 23 hours. And we compare bees, the free running period of bees that are exposed to the various doses of imidacloprid. And you can see that the higher doses, 10 and 100, actually cause them to have a faster rhythm, shorter cycle, which means that their clock is cycling faster than it should. We also look on the phase. When, they, when did they start their phase of activity? And bees typically start at around, st start their activity at around sun, sunrise or a little bit earlier. So the control, of course, were about this time. But when we look on the bees with the lower doses, they were not uh, strongly affected. Whereas with, with the high dose, they started the, their morning onset of activity much earlier than they should. So it's, it's showing that their circadian clock is uh, influenced by imidacloprid. And then uh, we try to see if it can actually affect their foraging behavior. So in a study that was led by Igor de Medici, he's a, a Brazilian postdoc that was uh, trained in my lab. 
Uh, he did a field uh, exper uh, experiment in the botanical gardens ne next to us. So we trained bees to go to a feeder that is about 300 meters away. And uh, it's, a, it's relatively short distance, but it's, it's the farther that we can get in the, in the city of Jerusalem. And at a certain day, uh, and for some of the treatment group, it treated the sugar syrup with the mediocre breed. And then after they, they, they learned to, to arrive and they were uh, either affected by midocloprid or not, uh, we did the test day and it's very similar to the experiment that I showed you before. So we put empty dishes in this case and Olive and uh, Igor and several other people in the lab recorded the number of bees that are visiting each one of these uh, empty uh, dishes. And these are the results. Because the, the distance is quite low, uh, uh, quite short, most of them were arriving to the right location, but uh, the bees that were fed on, on, a, on the pesticide have more bees that uh, deviated and actually from a statistical point of view, the differences were significant. And we repeated it with a different colony, different genotype, and the results were basically the same. Again, showing that the medical breed can actually interfere with the normal uh, foraging behavior of bees. So, uh, until now, I, I, was, I was speaking only on the effect of the, on the foragers and on circadian rhythms of foragers. And the foragers that you see here, you know that they have very strong rhythms. I hope that by now everyone understands how to read this uh, double plot actogram. They are active during the day and they actually sleep at night. Bees are really sleeping. And uh, if we will have time, I can show you even, uh, I think that I have a short clip of a, um, a sleeping bee. We, we did some studies on it. But in, in a honeybee colony, there is a division of labor that is related to age. That's the way that they organize their work in the hive. So the foragers are actually the older bees in the colony. Young bees typically do uh, nest uh, duties and the most important and the most common of them is brood care. We sometimes call it nursing. So here you can see uh, nurse bees that are caring for the larva. Here you can see the C-shaped structures that you see here are actually the babies of the bees. These are the larva and they are taken for all their needs. They are feeding them quite a lot and they are cleaning them and uh, and uh, warming them and uh, making sure that they are uh, happy and smiling all the time. And uh, there were no research uh, actually on the activity of nurses. It's, it's much more difficult, but using observation hives, it's possible to observe the bees. And um, in the late uh, 1990s, we started uh, doing these uh, observations and we discovered that uh, the nurse bees actually are active around the clock. You see that they don't have a clear rhythm. So they are like human mothers in a, in a way that they take, for the, uh, take care for their young uh, all over the, the circadian cycle, okay? And we knew from some of the other studies that there is profound plasticity actually in, in the division of labor system of the bees. Although it is influenced by age, we can create a strong need for nursing behavior by removing some of the nurses. And then some of the older foragers switch back to nursing activity. And in this case, it's quite, it's quite uh, interesting to ask if they have similar plasticity in their circadian rhythms because the foragers they forage during the day using the clock for all these activities that are uh, summarized here. But during the night, they, they like to sleep for six or seven or even nine hours. And if we induce them to be uh, nurses again, they have to be active around the clock. So we, we performed this experiment and actually we found that bees, it was the first, the first animal ever shown to have such profound uh, plasticity in its clock system. They can switch back between activity with and without circadian rhythm based on their task in the colony, which is socially regulated. So it's a socially regulated plasticity in circadian rhythm. 
Now, we, we did a lot of studies that I will uh, review only briefly here, trying to understand the underlying mechanism. So basically, when we started uh, exploring the system, there were two major hypotheses uh, to how something like this can happen. One of them was that when bees, honeybees are nursing the brood, something is stopping their clock. Their clock cannot function normally, and this is why they have no rhythm. The alternative hypothesis is what we call masking. So the clock of the nurse bee is functioning normally. So the, the wheels of the clocks are functioning normally, but it's not affecting the hands of the clock. It's not affecting the behavior and chronobiologists like to call it masking. So the circadian rhythms are internal, but they are masked. They are not affecting behavior. So in order to understand the machinery of the clock of the bees and how it can support such remarkable uh, natural plasticity, we need to get into the gear and wheels of the clock. And in biological system, this is of, of course relates to genes. So to those of you that are not trained in biology, I will just mention that when we speak of ge on genes on the genetical information, uh, it's, it's encoded in the DNA all the genes are encoded in the DNA. And in order to have some uh, physiological or biochemical function, they need to be transcribed into messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA is translated into a protein. So actually, most of the functions of genes in our body are done by protein. For example, proteins can build our cells and they can be receptors for uh, hormones and they can be enzymes. So, we were, uh, our contribution to the Anibi Genome Project was one of our contributions was that we try to characterize the clock system of the, of the bees. And by, by then we, we did it at around 2000. Uh, the genome was published in 2006. It was, some of the clock genes were known uh, in Drosophila and we cloned them in, in the Anibi and we characterized the general mechanism of the clock. So for those of you who are want to know how cells in our body, body can generate internal rhythms of about uh, 24 hours. So this is the mechanism. We have two um, uh, proteins, which are called cycle and clock. They activate the transcription of two other clock genes, which are known as perioid and cryptoprom. They are uh, transcribed into the messenger RNA. They go outside of the nucleus translated into proteins and the proteins of cry and pear enter back into the nucleus in which they shut down their own transcription. So it's a negative feedback. And there are additional mechanisms that I'm not showing here, which are making this cycle take about 24 hours. It's not exactly, it's never exactly 24 hours, but this is the machinery. And as I told you, it was known already in Drosophila. By the way, in 2017, the people that uh, described this mechanism for the first time in Drosophila, which is a fruit fly, they received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. But when we compare our, the mechanism that we found to the bees, it was actually quite different than the fly. Uh, some of the genes are different. And uh, it was actually very, very similar to what we see in, in our brain. So actually the bee, clockwork is very similar to what is functioning in the brain of each one of you. So in, in uh, later studies, I will focus a little bit, I will show you some data about these clock genes, period, cycle, clock, and cry, and I will mention also another, another uh, clock gene. So this is, for example, the cycle for the main clock genes in foragers. And in order to support this negative feedback, the messenger RNA levels that we measure here are cycling during the day. So those are bees that are collected from my observation hive that experience light. This is the yellow bar during part of the day and dark during the other part of the day. And you can see that there are very strong rhythms in all the levels of the clock genes for the foragers. But when we look on the nurse bees, which are active around the clock, actually they were attenuated or no cycling at all we suggest that something in the organization of the clock system, the, the molecular clockwork 
is not exactly the same in inerses and foragers. Now, we start uh, getting interesting if, if the nurses still have some clocks. And uh, when we observe bees inside observation hive, so here you see two nurse bees, one of them is marked with a tag, a white tag with a number 65, so we can track it individually. And this is another one, white 49, and we record their activity. You can see the nurse bees, even when they are under light dark illumination regime, still they are active around the clock, they have no rhythm. However, if we transfer them from the colony, we collect them in the colony and put them in these individual cages and monitor the locomotor activity, quite rapidly they develop very strong rhythms, almost as strong as uh, foragers. This means that either in the moment that we move them outside of their the, the colony, they start to develop their Rhythms, it's activated by the movement, or that they have a clock that is, that even when they are active around the clock, they have a clock, but the clock is not affecting their behavior. So, in order to distinguish between these two options, we perform an experiment in which we uh, moved nurse bees that are active around the clock in the hive. At certain times during the day, we remove them outside of the hive and monitor the locomotor activity. So if their activity, the onset of their activity is regulated by removing them from the hive, there will be a correlation between the time of removal from the hive and the onset of the morning activity. So we will see the relationship will, will be what we see here in this red dash line. Now we control the morning time. The morning time in these colonies was 8 a.m. because this is the time when we open the entrance to the colony and enable the bees to go outside. And uh, if there are the nurse bees inside the colony, because we studied only nurse bees are correlated with the time outside, we will see a correlation with the time of the morning. So we perform this experiment, we remove them at the different times during the day, and we found a very clear result. So actually, the nurses inside the dark eye, they know when it's morning and when it's evening outside. How do they know? And even if we cage them in a cage, they still know when it's, when it's morning and when it's, a, a, when it's a evening. So they receive some information. And we try to, uh, to, to see if the bees if the honeybees, uh, the nurse bees, they have a clock in several, using several different approaches. For example, uh, we use a very sophisticated technique that is uh, called DNA chips or uh, mi microarray. And uh, using this technology, building up on the fa fact that we have the honeybee genome, we can monitor the expression of many thousands of genes at the same time and see how many of them have circadian rhythms in their expression. So we look on the levels of messenger RNA throughout the day. And here you see a summary of the number of genes that are cycling as a function of the circadian phase. And you can see that many genes in foragers, about five, 541 genes are cycling. Most of them have a peak in the middle of the day or the middle of the night. But when we look on nurses, Actually, there were quite a few uh, genes that were cycling, much lower than in foragers, but it's still suggesting that they have internal clock. It's supporting our hypothesis that even the nurses have a clock. And here you see a group of very important uh, enzymes. It's called the cytochrome P450, which are involved in many processes, but one of them is breaking up um, uh, chemicals like uh, pesticides, for example, or natural pesticides. And you can see that they are cycling in both nurses in red and, for and foragers in blue, but in a different phase, which is uh, very interesting. We never, we never tested it further. Another way to understand if the bee has a clock is to try to look inside the brain of the bee and try to characterize the, the, the clock cells. So this is, it's actually very difficult to do because you need to develop an antibody against a protein of the clock. And it, it took us a lot of time to do it uh, successfully, but we, we were able to do it. And this is the way that the brain of the bee looks 
for those of you who are interested. So this is the central brain. This is what we call the optic lobes. And here we will have the retina. This, these are the eyes. So it's actually um, aligned with the, with the structure of the, of the bee head. And we characterize the, the cells that express perioid, which is a, a major clock gene. And you see them in green. And there are, uh, if we take a look, uh, closer look, this is the staining, which I will not explain in details, but this is the area of the central part of the clock. And I want to call your attention to two groups of cells. One of them, we call them lateral neurons ones, which are many and small. Other one, we call them lateral neuron two. And then not, not, uh, both of them express pair, which is the green color. This is the clock gene. Some of them also express a neuropeptide, which is called PDF, which is also very important in the circadian system of insects. So we collected nurses and foragers around the clock and stained their brain with these antibodies to characterize what's going on in their clock cells, really looking on the wheels of the clock in this case. And here you can see the summary of these results. Each one of these panels is a group of clock cells. And the only thing that you need to take from here, and this is the time, the time of collection, is that at some times during the day, there is a strong green color. So the clock, the level of the clock gene, are, or the clock protein in this case, are higher. And you can see that both in foragers and in air cells, it's about the same. So this is the LN1 and this is the LN2. And if we summarize two repetitions that we did and uh, we see the average intensity of the staining, we can see that in foragers in blue and in nurses in red, it's, it's about the same. So when we look on the clock cells, we can clearly see that even the nurses that are active around the clock in the constant environment of the eye, they still have a clock that can measure time. So let's do a summary of what I showed you until now. So if we look on a forager bee, it has a lot of circadian clock in, in its body, in the brain, in the antenna, in some other parts. All of them are functioning like in any other animal or insect that are active during the day. So it's, it's the standard way of the, the circadian system organized behavior. If we put a young bee uh, without brood, it will be about the same. But if we expose bees, specifically young bees, to the brood, to the larva, for example, we see a different function. Some of their clocks have the same phase as in foragers. This is marked here by blue. Other, like the antenna, for example, have a different phase, which is marked by green. And other uh, clock and clock control system that are cycling in foragers are simply not cycling in nurses. So this is what we understand by now about the molecular basis of uh, plasticity in circadian regions. Now, I showed you that if you, we remove bees, nurse bees from the hive, they still know when it's morning and when it's evening. How do they know? If they, even if we cage them and they don't see the, the, the sun, they still know. And there are several explanations. One of them is that they can go outside, but I told you that it's not the case. You already know that it's not the case. Other, other possibility is that foragers that are depicted here by the green color, when they are coming back to the colony, they synchronize the clock of the nurse bees and it's a kind of, of a social network that they can syn synchronize each other. And the third possibility is that the foragers when they are active, they change the environment of the eye. For example, they release a lot of CO2 and the CO2 can synchronize the clock of the nerve species. So this is a kind of, we call it self-organization system. Uh, the literature also suggests that maybe the queen is ruling the colony as in synchronizing the workers, but uh, we already know for many reasons that uh, it's not the case the queen have no rhythm she's active around the clock she doesn't know when it's day and when it's night so it's probably not the case but still we want uh, to see if, if there is social synchronization in bees and we did a lot of experiment like the one that i'm showing here so we put bees that, that they have different rhythms that are depicted by the different colors of the clock and after a while we saw that they can they can 
excuse me, synchronize each other. And uh, encouraged by this uh, very strong social synchronization, we decided to do something that was never done before, to try and compete synchronization of the clock by light, which is known as the most important and evolutionary conserved factor that set the time of the circadian clock compared to social synchronization that at least in honeybees seems to be important. So we did the following experiment. We have, we have observation hives with a colony and the bees could forage outside, but we control the time in which they can go outside. And the colony was inside the lab and we can control the illumination regime here. So we have three group, groups of bees. We have foragers that can go outside and being exposed to the sun and to other factors outside. We have young bees that, we, that were in cage. So they experienced the light dark illumination regime but they didn't experience the hive uh, environment. So they are responding only to the light. And then we have the most important uh, group of nurses, which are inside the hive and they are, ex they are interacting with the foragers. They couldn't go outside in some of the studies, but they also experienced the light dark illumination regime. And there were six hour differences between the light dark illumination regime and the phase of forager activity. And after uh, one week, we move them into these individual cages and monitor their circadian rhythms to see what is the phase of their internal clock. And this is the summary of the, of the results. It's a little bit complex. It's called circular statistics. It's depicting the onset of activity. So the different numbers here are the time of day. So this is midnight, 6 a.m., noon, and so forth. And the black part is when the colony was dark and the yellow one is when it was illuminated. And the donut shape that you see here is when the, the colony entrance was open and this, this uh, uh, no entrance uh, sign is when it was closed. And each one of the dots showing the onset of activity of an individual bee. And you see that the onset of activity for the young bees in the cage was about the time when we have the light on. And this is the offset of activity, which you can see that it's about the time of light off. When we look on foragers, it's a little bit more complex. Let's start with the end of their activity. The offset of activity was about the time when we closed the colonies. So it was mostly affected by foraging activity and not by light off. And the onset of activity was about intermediate. Now the important group is the nurses because they are exposed both to the light dark illumination regime and to the activity of the foragers. And as you can see, they were more similar specifically with the uh, onset of activity. They were more similar to the foragers than to the light. And the, this was uh, the first evidence that in, in honeybees, social synchronization can override uh, synchronization by light. It's still the only animals that show this specific uh, pattern. But what are the cues that mediate social synchronization? What it means, social synchronization? So light synchronization, we know that it's a certain wavelength that can synchronize the clock. But how can social interactions synchronize the clock? So there are, there are many things, many social factors in the eye. For example, there are pheromones, which are chemicals that use the communication, there are vibrations, there are release of uh, CO2 and O2, there are changes in temperature, there are many things that are related to uh, the activity of foragers that can change during the day. So uh, Oliver Schiller started to uh, test these uh, factors and I will show you here an experiment in which he tested the effect of substrate bone vibrations. So we have foragers, group of foragers, they have very strong rhythms. And at uh, about 80 centimeters from them, but on the same substrate, he put cages with uh, young bees, their nurse age. And at the same distance, but on a different substrate, he put another group of bees. So the distance is the same. He also suck all the air that uh, such the smells will not be important. So he was focusing on substrate uh, bone vibration. 
And then he used the very similar techniques to what I showed you before to study how well the bees are synchronized with each other. And what he found is that the foragers, as expected, are very well synchronized with each other and with the time of day-night cycle outside. On the other end, the bees that was, were on the different substrate were not synchronized with each other. And the bees of a similar age, by the way, all of them are the same genotype, were very well synchronized. This is consistent with the idea that substrate bone vibrations can synchronize the activity of the bees. I will show you also another experiment that Oliver did. In this case, he tested the effect of high volatiles. So we have free foraging colonies outside the lab. Some of them have bees that were freely foraging and Oliver sucked the air from these colonies and blow it over cages with young bees. And the control were empty hives with similar number of combs and same temperature. We heated the, this uh, small colonies uh, to the same temperature. He also sucked the air and exposed the bees. And then we tested their synchronization. And again, we found that the foragers have very strong rhythms. They are synchronized with day night cycle and with each other. Uh, but the bees that were not exposed to the smell of the hive was not synchronized. And similar bees that were exposed to the smell or to the odors of the hive, they were nicely synchronized, which means that also odors can synchronize their activity. We also develop a, a new system in which we can uh, test the synchronization or coupling between pair of bees. It's a very complex uh, system. And this allows us to put bees in individual cages. So here, this is like a tray in the lab. Each one of the circles is a cage with a bee. And we could see the effect of uh, different uh, distances and uh, connections, which unfortunately I don't have time to, to show you. But what I want to show you is a, an experiment in which we compare uh, two bees young bees in, in the open uh, circles that are in a similar distance from a forager that is in this blue circle here, either on the same tray or in a different tray. And we compare the coupling strength, which is an index for how well they are synchronized with each other. So this is the power of this uh, system. We published it only in 2018. And here you can see again what we compared. And here you can see the coupling strengths. The, the higher the value here, the better they are synchronized with each other. And you see the open bars are the, um, on, the, on the same tray and the uh, gray bars are on a different tray. And you see that in three different uh, trials, each one of them with bees from a different genotype or different colony, always bees on the same tray are better synchronized, which is consistent with the transfer again, of uh, vibrations, because smell will go in the same, uh, it's a function of distance, but vibration go only between bees on the same train. So if I want to summarize what, what I showed you is basically very good evidence that bees can be synchronized by means of subset bone vibration. So if when bees are active, actually they are moving and they are using the very small vibrations on the comb. But this seems to be important and it's working in the same way that the metronomes can uh, synchronize each other. So if you will see this uh, very classical experiment with metronomes, you see that in the beginning, each one of them has a different phase. But at a certain time, just follow the metronomes here, they are synchronized to the same phase. It will take a little bit, but they will reach here. Now they are almost all of them. And this is by transferring vibrations to the substrate in which they are located. And there are many nice videos and explanation for this, for the, phys for the underlying physics in the, in the internet. So we think that the bees are a kind of a biological a metronomes in the way that they are synchronized. So to summarize what, what I showed you today, so we were speaking about task-related plasticity in circadian rhythm. So we show, we, I show you that 
Specifically, the nurses are very interesting when they are caring for the brood. They have a very complex organization of their circadian rhythm. Some processes in their brain and actually some processes in their body are under circadian regulation, other are not, and they have different phases, a very complex system, very unique system. And the, the interactions with the, with the brood is actually what controlling it. We already know that both pupa and larva can, can induce this activity around the clock and this reorganization of the circadian system. We still don't know about eggs. And they, they still have some uh, clocks in the brain that are ticking. And those are synchronized by social synchronization. And at least we know about at least two factors that are important. Comb vibrations are probably the most important ones, but colony odors, we think that it's mostly CO2, are uh, also important. And finally, I want to, to thank so, uh, the people that actually did the work and my collaborators. So you can assume that I haven't uh, done all this work by myself. I have a lot of students and postdocs and collaborations and uh, it's cost a lot of money. So you can see the agency that supported it and I'm grateful for them. And if you want to learn more about our research, you are most uh, welcome to visit uh, my website. So just, uh, you can just uh, write in Google Guy Bloch uh, group and it will uh, get uh, to this website. And I will be happy to take uh, questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Guy. There are a few questions already and anyone who hasn't yet uh, posed their question can do so using the chat. Okay, so uh, Mansour is asking, first he says hello and thank you for this beautiful presentation. He asks, do the bees all have the same behaviors according to different uh, climatic zones? Uh, for example, between Europe, Israel, Africa? So, uh, generally speaking, it's, a, it's about the same. <clears throat> In terms of sun compass navigation, there will be some differences between the southern and the northern part of the uh, of the planet, of course. <clears throat> and uh, in this regard, I will mention that uh, the cycle of the sun uh, looks different uh, over the horizon in the southern and the northern hemisphere. Okay. But basically, the, the behavior is, uh, is very similar. And actually, very similar behaviors to what I showed you here we also find in bumblebees, I didn't show you the results, but we also study bumblebees, which have a, a little bit different uh, social organization. They are also social bees, but we see the same principle. So I think that what we discovered here and I shared with you is actually quite uh, uh, common in social insects. Okay, thank you. Um, Balaji is asking, is there any measure of a happiness and fear in bees under observation with vibrations around them like uh, instrument activity or observer's activity, especially when they're moved from uh, the colonies? And uh, is there any music response from the bees? Being an engineer, I'm just curious. <laughs> Those are uh, really excellent questions. So, uh, Von Frisch was the, the main hero of uh, studying the behavior of bees. He, he got the Nobel Prize uh, also for uh, physiology or medicine in uh, 1973 for discovering the dense language of the bees and uh, uh, the way that they are um, uh, navigating and many other factors. He was always speaking about happy bees and the uh, bees that are not so happy. And you can actually see some uh, Science, of course, when they are when they are pissed off, when they are uh, angry, you can see it because they buzz in a different way, they move in a different way, and they, uh, if you work with bees, you will learn very very well to identify when your bees are not happy because the, the next moment they will uh, try to sting you, and you you can see when they are upset, you know whether they are you know their happiness. And, uh, and whether they have something like sadness, uh, it's, it's a matter of interpretation. Scientifically, it's very difficult to know about it because uh, in human, we can do it when we ask human about their feeling uh, with the animals like bees and many other animals, we cannot really ask them. So it's, it's, a, it's more like uh, subjective interpretation. 
but uh, they have a very complex way of communication, which has two main arms. One of them relates to vibrations, and, uh, and uh, which can be substrate bone vibrations, like what I discussed here, but it can be airborne vibrations, which are basically uh, some kind of noise that they made. We, we hear it as buzzing, but it's probably more complex. They also have some, some other uh, um, voices that they, that they are making, and it's, it's important in, in communication. So using engineering technique, you can, you know, people are now, when, when it's so important to monitor bees, people are putting uh, various uh, sensors into bee colonies, including uh, uh, odot uh, uh, auditory sensors and try to understand these communication signals. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Astrid is asking about, uh, um, have you had a loss of bees for any reason? In Guatemala, due to crops, the loss of the colonies uh, population is very common. I know that it's a, a wider beekeeping question, but uh, maybe um, does your research relate to any of those uh, phenomena? Hmm. So my, my main research is, uh, is focusing on really this uh, basic science uh, questions that I presented. Uh, but of course, I'm uh, immersed in the community and I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, know, I know about the, also the, the well-being of the bees. So bees are disappearing for many different reasons. The main two reasons that are believed to be important all over the world are disease, mostly uh, viruses, viral diseases. It's like the COVID-19 that we are experiencing now. And the, one of the main ways that viruses are transferred in, in honeybee colonies is by a mite that it's called varroa mite. So the mite, they actually bite the bees. And if they are uh, carrying viruses, they will transfer the virus from one bee to the other. So one of the main ways to uh, keep your bees happy is to treat against varroa mites. So the varroa are, are parasites and they are, <clears throat> they are causing a lot of uh, problems. So varroa and the viruses, and the viruses, by the way, can also be transferred without varroa, but varroa definitely is improving the transfer, at least for some of them. The other source of concern are the pesticides and mostly the neonicotinoids, which I presented a little bit in the first part of the talk. So neonicotinoids are uh, the most commonly used pesticides throughout the world now. And the reason, there is a good reason for it, and that you can, they are extremely toxic for bees, for uh, insects in general. So they're used against insects, of course, not, not against the bees, because they can be used with very, very low amounts. So in the beginning, people actually didn't believe that such low amounts can affect the, the, uh, the well-being of the bees. It took some time. There was the, actually there is still an ongoing debate between the companies that produce the pesticides and the scientific community and the beekeepers about whether neonicotinoids are really dangerous to the bees or not. I think that scientists have no doubt about it. The scientific evidence are very, very strong. And uh, now in, in the European Union, for example, they are banning the use of uh, some of the neonicotinoids. So if, and now ne neonicotinoids are usually uh, systemic. So they are given to the plant and it's go through the roots and it's actually through the, all the tissue of the plant. So when the bees are getting to the flowers and they suck the nectar, the nectar can be contaminated with neonics. And because neonics are affected, even in low amounts, it can kill your bees. So if, if uh, farmers around you are using neonics or other pesticides, it can risk your bees. Okay, thank you. Um, Guy, uh, maybe um, shut your uh, sharing so then we can see you in uh large format when you are speaking. Yes, okay, great. Uh, okay, so um, Amit Kumar says, nice session, Guy Blosser. 
Um, and Camilo says, great presentation, a lot to learn from this presentation and all the research you have done. And uh, um, another asteroid, this is a different asteroid. This one says, uh, excellent knowledge about the behavior with bees. Uh, no, no, not this one. It's a different the second asteroid. Thank you for all of the amazing effort. Hello from Australia. Uh, there is an hyperactivity during aggression and happiness behavior. Is there um, any uh, hyperactivity during aggressive and happiness behavior? How is it different? Hmm. Um, so, you know, we, I, I can answer it in, in several different levels, but with bees, of course, they don't have a, we cannot understand their faces in the same way that we understand humans. So we look on relatively crude behavior, what, the, the way that they move their wings, the way that they move from one place to the other, if they waggle their abdomen. So this is the kind of things that we can see. And, uh, and they, they are more active, uh, both during the time that they are uh, aggressive and when they are what we think that they are happy. So uh, during what uh, uh, beekeepers like to call a nectar flow, it's the, it's the, in, in, our, in Israel, for example, in Europe and, and the US, it will be the, the, the early spring when there are a lot of flowers and the bees that's when people think that the bees are really happy, they are flying and they're collecting a lot of nectars. They have less enemies during this time. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, von Frisch and uh, actually many beekeepers uh, thinks that the bees are happy is that it's, it's more difficult to make them angry during this time. They are just busy with their issues. They, they, they just seem seems happy. But of course, it's, it's the interpretation of the human observer more than, than you can actually see. But to your question, yeah, they, they are showing a higher level of, uh, of activity typically in both of these cases. It's, it's, it's very easy to distinguish uh, angry bees from what we call a, a happy bee. So, so if we're already on angry bees, um, Florence asks, uh, what can trigger them to attack a particular person um, at, at any given time? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I, I have a, a good experience with, with my students because when I'm teaching my students to work with bees, uh, specifically in the context of research, you have to try to minimize the interference to the bees. So I'm teaching them to work without gloves. The gloves are, are, are me meant to protect us, right, from getting stung. So if you work without gloves, you have to be more careful, right? And uh, what, what we learned with this experience is that some of the students, even if they are, they are very calm and they are not uh, moving fast, which can uh, agitate the bees, still they are getting stung more. And uh, the common wisdom is that, you know, bees, you know, we smell differently, depending on many different factors, including what we eat. And some of the smells of people are, um, increasing the, the aggression of, of bees for some, some reason. Of course, there are other factors that relates to the way that we behave. So if this question was by someone that is working with bees, so bees will attack something that is moving fast and they are very, very sensitive to dark uh, figures which are like something like a pair, okay? So if you, if you want to work with a bees, you, will, you want to be dressed like a kaba that I see in my window because he is dressed white. So um, beekeeping suits are typically white and you try to, uh, white is less attractive for their aggression. Don't go uh, with black. So when, when I'm teaching people to work with bees, for example, I will not allow them to use a watch because the watch for the bees is also something dark that is moving and it can attract them to, to sting. Uh, and try to be calm as much as, as you can. Uh, I think that when people are, are scared and they start to uh, sweat a little bit more, it can also uh, increase the aggression. And, and finally, there are uh, there are lines of bees, so during the work, the a kind of semi-domestication of the bees that we are using in commercial beekeeping, 
we try we try to select for more uh, bees that are less aggressive and, and uh, produce more honey. This is the main the main factors that are typically taken taken into account. So I hope that I answered the, the, the question. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Subhadeep is asking, is there any difference of synchronization, uh, behavioral differences uh, between bees kept for honey farming and naturally natural habitat bees? So we never work with, with really natural uh, bees. We, in Israel, we hardly have bees that are uh, natural. I, I think that there are some. But in the most of the Western words, the common wisdom is that uh, because of the problem of the varroa, bees cannot survive in, uh, in nature. I'm not sure that it's the case, but this is the common wisdom. Um, and actually, because of the problem of the varroa that I mentioned before, this is the parasitic mite. We actually need to treat it. So, so actually, we. We need to give some kind of uh, acaricides, some chemicals that will control the varroa population. And if you don't do it, the colony can collapse. So th this is why we don't have much uh, natural lives. But I don't, I don't think that the, the general princi the, the principles that I showed you here will differ between uh, different types of bees. I think that it's very, very uh, basic to their to their biology. That's that's the way that they coordinate their activities. Okay. Um, um, one, uh, I think, towards the end, one other uh, question: um, What are, are there any practical um, uh, applications of your research for uh, regarding human behavior or regarding uh, practical beekeeping? So I, I think that the the fact that the uh, circadian rhythms are so important for, for bees and uh, uh, some of the flowers, it's, it's very important for them to come at a certain time. I think that it's something that they uh, needed to, take, uh, to be taken into account. Um, I think that there are also aspects about the fact that uh, I didn't show here, but I told you that we also study sleeping bees. Bees need to sleep also, so disturbing them, for example, when uh, colonies are transferred and the, the vibrations uh, during transfer can prevent them from sleeping well. It can also be uh, important. And of course, the, the, the environmental stressors like uh, insecticides that affect the clock, it's also uh, another consideration. It's, it's, it's part of the big picture, I would say. And in, in, in terms of uh, human behavior, so I, I would say that the mission of basic scientists like myself is not really to solve specific problems to human or to bees, but to understand how biological systems function, you know, the biology of the system and understanding opened, uh, set the, the stage for many other implications, but the implications need to be based on, on very detailed and uh, well uh, studied biology. So our contribution is to understand the biology, the system, the biological clock, the regulation of the biological clock. And because the system, the biological clock specifically, it's a very, what we call conserved. So I showed you that it's very similar in mammals and in bees. Uh, many of the findings that we are finding uh, with bees can be, uh, can influence or guide even research with other systems. So it's uh, contributing to the main pool understanding. Um, as I told you, the circadian clock is important for many, many different processes. And what we are uh, teaching the community about the plasticity in the clock and the social regulation is, is important for many of these uh, issues. Okay. So, um, okay. So I think uh, you've answered all, everybody's questions, more or less. Uh, there, there are a few questions here that are very um, that pertain to practical beekeeping. I don't think I should uh, pose them to you. I, I would ask you. Maybe you have something to say about um, what about bee, bee venom? Is it of any value to us humans? So there is what it's called the apitherapy, which part of it is is treating. Uh, various diseases, uh, specifically uh, sclerosis, with uh, stinging 
using B venom. It's, it's like actual stinging at, at several different uh, location. And uh, there are evidence included in the, in the scientific uh, literature that it's can help. B venom is a, is a very rich uh, composition of chemicals. And uh, I think that some of them can have uh, can be important in, in various, you know, it, it says, for example, anti, uh, uh, anti uh, bacterial peptides that might be important for some, some way. So it's, it can be practical in, in, in some ways. It's uh, one thing that <clears throat> need to be understood, <clears throat> excuse me, in the context of B venom is that the venom of honeybees specifically was evolved during evolution to be extremely painful. So, you know, it's, it cannot kill us. It's not like a, the venom of, the, of a snake, for example, or a spider that can be very dangerous. It's the, the, the venom of the bee is, was selected during evolution to be very painful to uh, mammals, large mammals, because large mammals are attacking uh, bee colonies for the lar large uh, reward. They, they can get there. So the meaning of this is that it's interfering or affecting many different processes that are associated with pain and asso associated with uh, some, some other uh, basic biological uh, processes, which means that if you understand these processes better, you can also manipulate, it, manipulate it uh, to your needs. Okay. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Guy Bloch, for this uh, fascinating uh, uh, lecture. And uh, thank you to all of you, all of the bee lovers around the world for having joined us. And uh, we hope to see you uh, again on future international days and future lectures. Uh, we welcome you to watch our recorded lectures uh, on, uh, on our YouTube channel. It's the Mashav MATC channel. And you can also invite your friends and share these videos with your friends. And uh, we would like to thank you again for being with us. And uh, uh, we wish you a very, very sweet day, as sweet as honey. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.